on this edition of the Fifth Estate, Gunfight in America. You had your peace. You had your peace. You had your peace. You had your peace. Be quiet. Hold on. Be quiet. Anybody that wants to disarm me can drop dead. And I'm here to tell you, 1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearms. It's a shootout over one of the country's most popular and lethal weapons. Continuing to hear what you believe to be gunfire. But if you expected compromise after the tragedy at Sandy Hook School, look again. When you must fight, don't lose. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. A battle royale on the airwaves. Going after our guns. Chipping away at our freedom. And on U.S. streets. And why it may be closer than you think. My argument is Canada is why don't you demand something that they're killing your citizens? Be that as it may, you're not going to take our guns away, Canadian. Hello, I'm Bob McHugh and welcome to the Fifth Estate. Even in the unrelenting litany of American mass shootings, the tragedy in December at that elementary school in Newtown, Connecticut somehow seems so much worse. Whether it's the ages of the children, the teachers shot trying to save them, or the military-style weapon used in the attack, the impact of Newtown has been profound. But for all the hope there might be common ground between the forces of gun rights and gun control, as you're about to see, the U.S. firearms industry is a deeply entrenched web of manufacturers, retailers, lobbyists, and at its very heart, the National Rifle Association, most powerful gun rights organization in the world, with a long history in which compromise has never been seen as a good thing. Individual that I have on the phone is continuing to hear what he believes to be gun It was 9.41 a.m. December 14th, when the police department in Newtown, Connecticut got the 911 call from Sandy Hook School. We heard like shots and everybody went on the ground and Miss Martin just closed the door and we went to the corner. I saw some of the bullets going past the hall. Officers were at the scene within minutes, but it was already too late because the shooter, a disturbed 20-year-old named Adam Lanza, came armed for war. His weapon of choice, a Bushmaster AR-15, a military-style assault rifle adapted for the civilian market, capable of firing around almost every second. There was a masked man came in and just started shooting. It belonged to his mother, as did the two large-caliber handguns he carried, the high-capacity ammunition magazines, and the shotgun police found in his car, all legally registered. Then, Adam Lanza shot his mother to death and drove to the school with her arson. The shooter is deceased inside the building. Before Adam Lanza killed himself, 20 children and six teachers would die. This afternoon, I spoke with Governor Malloy. Afterwards, it seemed the world had to stop and try to make sense of it all. We've endured too many of these tragedies in the past few years on behalf of the nation. At the White House, Barack Obama didn't, perhaps couldn't, hide his emotions. The majority of those who died today were children, uh, beautiful little kids between the ages of 5 and 10 years old. They had their entire lives ahead of them. Birthdays, graduations, weddings, kids of their own. And the president didn't try to disguise his resolve. And we're going to have to come together and take meaningful action to prevent more tragedies like this, regardless of the politics. But as you're about to see, changing something as fundamental as the American gun culture would be no easy task. Because what happened at Newtown has intensified a long-standing debate into the most bitter battle over gun control in modern U.S. history. I'm in favor of a nationwide ban on military-style semi-automatic assault weapons. Anybody that wants to disarm me can drop dead. 
the go-to rhetoric for them is, wouldn't it be fun to kill the people we disagree with? And I'm here to tell you, 1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearms. And the focal point is this. The AR-15 semi-automatic rifle that Adam Lanza used to gun down 21st graders and their teachers. Manufactured to resemble its military cousin, the legendary M16, the AR-15 can't shoot an uninterrupted spray of bullets, but it can fire as quickly as someone can pull the trigger, up to 45 rounds a minute. It's estimated there may be as many as 3 million semi-automatic assault rifles on American streets. Firearms industry researcher, Tom Diaz. So what the gun industry has done is taken designs that were specifically created to inflict maximum casualties on the battlefield, mm -hmm. modified them only to the extent necessary to be legal for civilian sale, and then sold them on the American civilian market. A combat carbine has to perform the first time every time. Diaz calls it the militarization of the U.S. firearms market and believes weapons like the AR-15 have exponentially increased the danger. And can now be the centerpiece of an effective home defense plan. They carry forward into civilian life precisely the function that they were designed for in combat, which is to kill or injure large numbers of people at close to medium range. And at Sandy Hook School, that's exactly what happened. Investigators say in all, Adam Lanza fired hundreds of rounds from that AR-15 semi-automatic rifle, killing his victims, first graders and teachers alike, with as many as 10 bullets apiece. I mean, you're dealing with ba basically babies mm -hmm. that haven't even tasted life yet. Lawyer Richard Feldman has been in the firearms industry for 30 years. He calls Newtown a game changer. It was obvious immediately to me this was going to be a, a huge issue, unlike uh, any of the other massacres that happened from time to time. And many on both sides saw it the same way. In a country with such frequent and horrific gun violence, the Colorado Movie Theater, the Tucson Shopping Center, Virginia Tech University, somehow this tragedy was not unfolding as the others had. This event had a staying power, and I think the key to it was, I know in my case, when I saw my children that day, without saying a word, I went over and just gave them a hug. And I think parents all over America who've never really thought about this, it can't happen in our neighborhood, it can't happen, suddenly realized it can happen in my kid's school. It's why in the days that follow, all eyes turned to the headquarters of the National Rifle Association, self-proclaimed defenders of the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, the right to bear arms. From my cold, dead hands. For over a century and a half, it's built its place as one of the most influential American institutions by unequivocally speaking out on behalf of guns and gun owners. It now has about 5 million members and a $300 million a year budget to put its money where its mouth is. But after Newtown from the NRA, for three days there was only silence. But in those first days, it seemed many people shared the feeling that what took place at the Sandy Hook School was a turning point. So shocking it demanded something must be done to make sure it never happens again. Some thought perhaps even the National Rifle Association might finally believe it was the time for change. All of the various options but that, that were hope to was about to fade. I'd like to introduce Wayne LaPierre. When the NRA's public face and voice finally took the podium, he insisted the problem in Newtown wasn't guns, but that there weren't enough of them. I call on Congress today to act immediately to appropriate whatever is necessary to put armed police officers in every single school in this nation. The NRA solution? Now, Eliminate the so-called sure gun-free school zones, intended to make American students safer. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. 
Are the president's kids more important than yours? Then why is he skeptical about putting armed security in our schools? Within days, the NRA turned up the rhetoric with this new TV ad. But he's just another elitist hypocrite when it comes to a fair share of security, protection for their kids, and gun-free zones for ours. Suddenly, the debate about gun violence that promised to be a meeting of the minds had devolved into threats of civil war. Like Hitler, like Stalin, like Mao. Fidel Castro took the guns. It happened to the Germans, French, it happened in China, Italy, it happened in Uganda. Spain, I mean, Japan. it's, it's it even up. using children. It reminds me of uh, Saddam Hussein when he used kids. Professional fundraisers on the right have said in order to get people to sit down and write that check or send in that credit card account, you have to tell them, Armageddon is tomorrow, the apocalypse is tomorrow. Here's the bad things that's gonna be happening. And the, it works for the NRA, they've done that for decades. And the NRA took full advantage of that moment after Newtown. In the weeks following the massacre, it claims to have enrolled over half a million new NRA members. Of the but Richard Feldman believes the NRA sees Newtown as a challenge to its survival. This isn't a manufactured crisis by any stretch. This is the real deal. Um, and uh, I think they realized it very quickly. Uh, I realized it immediately, uh, having been through it so many times. Uh, this was going to be a real battle royale. After the break, the NRA's battle royale becomes a death match. Where'd you purchase a weapon from, sir? Right down the street, okay. Arrowhead. Arrowhead pawn shop. Yes. And where some Canadian crime guns get their start. Hundreds of guns from your store end up in crimes. You're aware of that. No, it is chambered for a specific. How, how could you not be? Columbine. Virginia Tech. Tucson. Aurora. Fort Hood. Oak Creek. Newtown. 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 In the aftermath of the How Newtown more? killings, How many so many How voices many were raised against How gun violence. Classrooms? How many more? How many more? Enough. 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 Demand it seemed all agreed right the now. deaths would be even more senseless unless they inspired something good. As a husband. As a wife. As a human being for the children of Sandy Hook. How then to explain this? The military-style AR-15 semi-automatic assault weapon was already the most popular rifle in America, with an estimated three million in private hands. Stay in cover! I'll direct you to move when you're clear! What's more, the firearms industry spends millions each year marketing the AR-15 to underage shooters who may have fired the virtual version while playing violent video games. Get ready to move! But in the days after the shooting, Americans rushed to buy even more AR-15s, like the one Adam Lanza used to massacre the children at Sandy Hook School. In some places, prices doubled, but dealers couldn't keep them on the shelves. Whether that buying spree was from fear of a ban on assault weapons like the AR-15 or to exercise their constitutional rights didn't matter. It was precisely the hardline message the National Rifle Association has always sent in times of crisis. We're the longest standing civil rights organization in the U.S. The NRA is nothing of history is not consistent. Protectors of the Second Amendment. Advocating either you're with them or against them. We are the NRA, and the NRA is you. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And despite his oath, the NRA was convinced President Bill Clinton was no friend. Just months after he took office in 1993, four federal agents and six members of a religious cult were shot to death during a standoff in Waco, Texas. The president set out to put his mark on gun control, prohibiting the sale of the military-style semi-automatic assault weapon used in the Waco shootout. There are some adults that, that like to go target practice with these things. Well, they need to read a good book. 
Clinton and his White House advisors decided to pick a fight with America's law-abiding gun owners. The battle with the NRA was joined. It even accused Clinton of intentionally fomenting gun violence in order to build a case against them. Empty rhetoric and fraudulent legislation like the Clinton gun ban should be rejected. And Richard Feldman was about to incur their wrath as well. We have told you he's a lawyer and lobbyist, but not that he represented the National Rifle Association and firearms manufacturers, or that he gave Ronald Reagan his first assault weapon. In today's climate, it's hard to imagine. But in the late 90s, Feldman brokered a deal between the Clinton administration and American gun manufacturers to put child safety locks on their firearms. We believe devices which enhance safe storage can be useful in continuing to reduce child accidents. He says it seemed the right thing to do. It made sense to provide child safety locks with every gun we shipped, and uh, we made that announcement in the Rose Garden. The NRA didn't see it the same way. They regarded any compromise with the White House as treason. And after that day in the Rose Garden, Richard Feldman was public enemy number one. The word compromise has become a dirty word in American politics. It sort of equates, if you're a compromiser, to being a traitor. In his memoir, Confessions of a Gun Lobbyist, Feldman described his former NRA employers as a political cult more obsessed with wielding power than protecting constitutional rights. But a visit to the National Rifle Association website reveals how the NRA sees itself. Hi, I'm Wayne LaPierre, Executive Vice President. The NRA's of the chief executive says they're in the business of protecting freedom. It took 25 years, but you have restored the Second Amendment. Wayne LaPierre has called the U.S. government gun-grabbing goons, especially the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. The ATF is responsible for ridding American streets of illegal weapons. What the DEA is to drugs, the ATF is to guns. That was our goal, is to stop the flow of guns. Not to stop the individual from owning a gun, but to flow of guns. For 29 years, Jerry Nunziato was an ATF special agent, targeting those guns. You stop a person with a gun, that's one gun. You stop somebody that sells guns to the person, the street person, that's 10 guns. But if you stop the f source of a gun, it's around four or 500 guns that you've stopped going into the criminal market. That's especially daunting because in the U.S. today, there are more licensed gun stores than McDonald's restaurants. Over 50,000, in addition to tens of thousands of licensed pawn shops and private collectors. There is now one firearm for almost every American, over a quarter of a billion of them. Each year, approximately half of all the guns manufactured in the entire world end up in the U.S., in places like Clayton County, Georgia. Here outside Atlanta, the poverty of public housing and a thriving drug trade, combined with some of the weakest gun laws in the country, add up to a plague of violent crime, especially with handguns. We got a magazine over here. We got five rounds fired. Oh, yeah. You know what caliber? No, not yet. Shots fine, call. And in Clayton County, one name keeps coming up. Where'd you purchase a weapon from, sir? Right down the street, okay. Arrowhead. Arrowhead pawn shop? Yes, I got it. It's called a pawn shop, but Arrowhead is known far and wide for one thing, plentiful, easy guns. We first dropped in on owner Arthur Banks a few years ago. Easy to use or powerful and reliable. Safe? Yep. In an industry not known to be media friendly, we recorded the encounter with a small hidden camera. Uh, you're Mr. Banks? Hi, my name's Bob McEwen. I'm with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. We're in the neighborhood doing a story uh, that you might be able to help us with. Okay. Is, is this an interview you're doing now or? Uh, we'd like to do it right now. Yeah. Arthur Banks insisted no firearms dealers can positively predict where their guns will end up. But you do know that yeah, I don't know if hun I hundreds of guns from your store end up in crimes. You're aware of that. No, it, it is chambered for a specific. How, how could you not be? Well, take a regular 45. 
I would imagine many guns and many stores wind up in Bronx. I don't have any yeah. right now. So why do you think that would be? Maybe the area. Yeah. Uh, your sales practices? I mean, if, so, if someone comes in here, for example, buys 10 guns, mm -hmm. all 9 millimeters, mm -hmm. and then the following week or a couple of weeks later comes back and buys 10 more guns, all 9 millimeter, mm -hmm. would you consider that to be suspicious? Would, mm -hmm. you, would you make those sales? I don't know if I want to comment on this. The toll of gun violence in the United States is simply staggering. In 2011, over 8,000 gun murders. Annually, about 20,000 other deaths from firearm suicides and accidents. And 60,000 more Americans wounded after being shot by someone else or themselves. It's why the ATF wanted to identify the gun dealers who sold the most guns used in crimes. Remember Special Agent Jerry Nunziato? He designed the ATF computer system capable of tracing a quarter of a million crime guns each year. What it revealed was astounding. Of the tens of thousands of licensed American gun stores, just a tiny fraction, about 1%, sold almost two-thirds of all the guns traced back from crimes. You could analyze this and pinpoint the sources of guns, and we could put our energy on instead of a. Uh, 100,000 gun dealers that are selling guns, maybe on 100 of them that are really distributing a majority of the crime guns that we call them. Which took us back to the Arrowhead Pawn Shop in Georgia, where the store owned by Arthur Banks, then ranked number 18 on the ATF list. Banks argued as long as Georgia law allows him to make repeated sales of multiple handguns to a single person, if they end up in crimes, it's not his fault. But of the 80,000 gun dealers in the U.S., yours has been on the list of the top 20 in terms of crime guns, guns traced back. The top 20 of 80,000. I didn't know that. Do you feel responsibility when a gun sold here at Arrowhead ends up killing someone in a criminal event? I definitely wouldn't like that. But, but they've done investigations. Mm -hmm. They've found people who have come in here week after week and, and who've bought mm -hmm. a number of guns, 10, 12 guns, that have ended up in the hands of gangs in New York City. We do our job, sir. We do our job. The ATF tracing system was a big success. Maybe too big. Because the NRA sees virtually anything that could limit the availability of firearms, even guns used for crime as a violation of the right to bear arms. Through campaign contributions and other support for elected representatives, in 2004, the NRA pushed through legislation severely restricting what the ATF can do with that crime gun information. They identified the worst dealers, but incredibly, by law, they're only allowed one investigative visit to each every year. And just as remarkably, it can be a felony for the ATF to share those statistics with anyone else. Agent Jerry Nunziato, who's now retired, says at the very least, the data from the ATF computer system should have allowed firearms manufacturers to police themselves and cut off the worst dealers. All it would be is that the manufacturers say, wait a second, you know, we're getting a lot of crime guns. Who, then he could call and go, going back to one distributor and say, you know, what's going on here? And he says, well, I'm selling them all to Jerry's Gun Shop. Hey, we don't want our products sold to Jerry's Gun Shop if he's selling them to Crooks. Stop it. You're not going to sell my guns anymore. That would stop it immediately. But that didn't happen. There are those who believe the NRA and the firearms industry care less about gun crime than about protecting the dealers who sell their products. When we return... For people in power to think that they belong to the ruling class and that we were made to be ruled. The man who believes where guns are concerned, Canada, is a dirty word. Would you really rather see a U.S. where 330 million people are all carrying a Glock on their hip? Or one in which there are far fewer guns and far fewer gun crimes? We don't want to be Canada. We don't want to be Great Britain. We want to be the United States. You're not going to take our guns away, Canadian. And Mr. Lapierre said the NRA's job is to keep the U.S. from going the way of Canada. 
And I just want to know what he means exactly by that. The National Rifle Association sees itself as the protector of American freedom and the right to bear arms, even, apparently, in Canada. The government ruined me. The they need for guns is a message the firearms industry would like to export. This is Canada? You know, this is not the Canada I know. The uh, seven million firearms owners of this country have ceased to trust its government. What's at stake is, is a freedom. It's a freedom. It's, it's, it's life. The NRA produced this infomercial a few years ago as part of its campaign against the Canadian gun registry. Sacrificed on the altar of politics. Singled out and It depicts the true north as neither strong nor free with our gun-loving citizens living in fear of our gun-grabbing government. They want every firearm seized in this country. That's the long-term agenda. It's crazy. I mean, they think they know better than our founding fathers. For years, we've requested interviews, and the NRA has always declined. You can't have a firearm in your home for personal protection in, the, in, the, in our nation's capital. So a while back, a when we saw the advertisement for a Second Jefferson Amendment rally Boy. outside New York City, we went. Down. The headliner was NRA boss Wayne Lapierre. Because the membership is really the wall between the Second Amendment and those that want to take it away. Hopefully, As usual, he took aim at countries with strong gun control. The NRA's job, he says, is to stop the United States from going the way of Canada. You know what happened in Canada, where they ban guns and gun crime has done nothing but go up since they passed the ban. For the record, gun crimes in Canada have not gone up. In fact, over the past 30 years, armed robberies and homicides have steadily declined. Today, an American is seven times more likely to be murdered by a firearm than a Canadian is. We need to go out and get in their face, stand up, and make those Boston tea spillers proud. Thank you very much, and let's keep fighting. Mr. Lapierre, can I just have a sec with you? We wanted to ask Wayne Lapierre why the NRA supports the gun laws and dealers that account for most of the illegal weapons that end up on Canadian streets. We were told he'd be staying after his speech. He didn't. Can I? Can I have a moment? Just a word. Oh, we've got to go. Just to the a airport. word. It would take it would take two minutes. No, we've got to go. I'm sorry. We've we, got another schedule. I, I just want to. We're from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and Mr. Lapierre said the NRA's job is to keep the U.S. from going the way of Canada, and I just want to know what he means exactly by that. He said he's got to go. He's overscheduled. The demonization of gun control countries like Canada is a common tactic to rally the NRA troops, according to firearms researcher and author Tom Diaz. Well, I think one thing they'd say, yeah, but so you want us to give up our freedoms so we can be like other countries? Good grief, have you been to Canada lately? It's practically a dictatorship. Maybe they have left gun deaths, but they're not as free as we are, and you never can tell they're gonna come get us, and we need these guns. I want a real gun to be able to protect myself and my family because the more guns, the better is Larry Pratt's run, motto. Uh, He's CEO of Gun Owners of America, billed as the no compromise gun rights group. Forget the NRA's plan for school guards with guns. Pratt wants every adult in every school in the U.S. to be packing a firearm. I'm suggesting teachers, principals, everybody on staff who has a concealed carry permit should be able to carry. Right now, the law prohibits that. Would you really rather see a U.S. where 330 million people are all carrying a Glock on their hip? Or one in which there are far fewer guns and far fewer gun crimes? We don't want to be Canada. We don't want to be Great Britain. We want to be the United States. You're not going to take our guns away, Canadian. For years, one man came to personify that battle between the NRA, its supporters, and the U.S. government. His name is Sandy Abrams, and at one point, his store outside Baltimore ranked 37 of 80,000 licensed dealers for most crime guns sold. In the mainstream media, 
uh, all gun dealers are criminals and they sell guns to criminals. That's, that's the, the thread that's put out there, even though you may not have, have done anything wrong. The Department of Justice called him a danger to the public, with over 900 violations of American firearms law. Abrams claimed he was unfairly persecuted for bad bookkeeping. Bookkeeping. Uh, not crossing I's, dotting T's, uh, dotting I's, crossing T's, not, uh, not putting down the county the person lived in, putting down the wrong county the person lived in. But the result was that hundreds of Abrams firearms went undocumented, which meant they were untraceable and could have been sold to anyone. And if some of the violations were clerical, others were not. Among the guns traced back to your store, guns used in 11 murders, in 41 assaults, in 46 drug cases, do you that feel any responsibility for That doesn't those mean guns? that the dealer does anything illegal or anything wrong. Any dealer can run a background check on the person, require photo ID, and so forth. Now, at what point does the dealer's responsibility end? In other words, they can't tell what's in a person's heart. Sandy Abrams eventually was convicted, lost his license, and closed his business. But for years until then, he remained a director of the National Rifle Association, re-elected three times, even as the ATF was prosecuting him. The NRA even paid for his lawyer. The license is gone. It's two years. If you want to discuss something else, fine. If not, we'll end the conversation. Well, I'd like to talk about the role of the NRA, which I think it's fair to say supported you through yeah, a lot. we're finished. So what does all of that mean for Canadians? Well, the fact of the matter is that illegal guns flow north across the border for one simple reason. Firearms laws in Canada are among the toughest in the world, and the American laws are not. The result, it's estimated up to 70% of Canadian crime guns are smuggled from the U.S., as many as tens of thousands a year. Regina Lombardo is a special agent with the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, until recently posted, of all places, in Toronto, assigned to trace guns used in Canadian crimes back to their American roots. We typically will see the, what we call a traditional traffic type f firearm, which is your 380s, your 9mm um, Smith & Wesson high points, uh, Glocks. Most crime guns get their start in states where they're available almost on demand then are transported along the smuggling route police call the Blue Steel Highway to places with much tougher gun laws, big northeast cities like New York, or across the border to Canada. Oh, well, the appetizers of guns on the streets with, with dudes in the, in the neighborhood that's just doing bad stuff is, is ridiculous. I'm not a fool, you know what I'm saying? I'm not naive. I see what's going on in the streets, and I said, you know, I can make some money off this. Lamont Toombs has been on the right side of the law for several years now. But before that, he spent five years in federal prison for gun trafficking. With demand on the streets of places like Brooklyn and supply at favorite dealers like Arrowhead in Georgia, he says he could buy and sell several firearms every trip along the Blue Steel Highway, pocketing thousands of dollars a day. Oh man, it was like buying bubble gum. You go in there, you tell them, you point it out, you see the one you want, you got the money, you give them the money, and that's what, that's what it was. Lamont Toombs is out of the business. Because of his felony conviction, he couldn't legally buy a gun anyway. It's why many traffickers use what are known as straw purchasers to do their transactions. Special Agent Lombardo says for someone with a clean record who needs money, it could seem like a good deal. Go into a gun shop or a gun show and purchase um, five handguns mm -hmm. and with that I will give you you know a thousand bucks and you can keep one of those firearms and for gun smugglers the world's longest undefended border can be easy pickings blending into the hundreds of thousands of travelers who cross each day almost always by car they will typically come in secreted inside the door panels um, wheel wells in the back we've seen them in engine blocks and across the border in Canada with markups of perhaps a thousand percent, the risk might even seem worth it.
we know that the you know uh, cost of a weapon in the U.S. let's say might be two hundred, three hundred dollars. In the streets of Toronto, they're looking at two thousand, twenty-five hundred, three thousand for a Glock. But consider this. Agent Lombardo's most high-profile Canadian case in 2006, oh, I saw you. Oh, I saw you. when they traced 85 weapons from Ohio, used in Canada in attempted murders, armed robberies, and one of them, a semi-automatic pistol, in the mass execution of eight members of the Bandito motorcycle gang in southern Ontario. The American who orchestrated it was sentenced to spend most of the rest of his life in U.S. federal prison. Actually, that was the most highest sentencing we've ever re ever received in a firearms trafficking case. How much? Uh, he pled to 32 years. Add it all up, and it's why former ATF agent Jerry Nunziato believes the most important gun laws for Canada are those south of the border, where crime guns are so easily purchased in the first place. My argument is Canada is why don't you demand aid the government not to do this? You know, demand something that they're killing your citizens. When we come back, what happens next? We're at what's called a tipping point. The country might go one way or another. I'm afraid if it doesn't go, then all hope is lost. Why do you need semi-automatic weapons of any kind on the U.S. market? It's not a question of need. It's a question of a right that's in our Constitution. In mid-January, barely a month after Newtown, many people may well have believed the critical mass behind gun control might never be greater. Why does anybody need an assault rifle if they're not going to war? I believe that the government has the ability to ban these weapons. I don't think they do. A, a semi-automatic weapon. I don't think there's any reason to have 33 bullets in a killing machine that you can take into a place like a school. And you're telling me it's not a matter of common sense that if you don't have an ability to shoot off 30 rounds without reloading, that just possibly you could reduce the loss of life? The president and vice president announced their proposed firearms legislation, surrounded by children who'd written to ask for their help. First, it's time for Congress to require a universal background check for anyone trying to buy a gun. Their prime targets were still the AR-15 and high-capacity magazines. Congress should restore a ban on military-style assault weapons and a 10-round limit for magazines. But industry insiders, including the NRA, have repeatedly warned they will never support an assault weapons ban. Going after our guns. Chipping away at our freedom. Out of Richard gun. Feldman owns three AR-15s himself and maintains the best argument against prohibition is that it didn't reduce gun crime when Bill Clinton tried it. Criminals don't use rifles. Uh, it happens. But 99 out of 100 times when a gun's misused, it's a handgun. Not a long gun. Indeed, of more than 8,000 U.S. firearms murders in 2011, handguns, not assault rifles, accounted for the vast majority. But for Gun Owners of America CEO Larry Pratt, the point is much more fundamental. Why do you need semi-automatic weapons of any kind on the U.S. market? It's not a question of need. It's a question of a right that's in our Constitution. Even if tens of thousands of people are being killed and tens of thousands more being injured. That is not going to ever be a reason to get rid of our means of protecting ourselves from the government. These particular kinds of rifles present such horrific opportunity that we're just going to say as a society, we don't want it. But like many on both sides, gun control advocate Tom Diaz doubts there will be the votes in Congress to get a ban passed but he says the massive unease about guns after Newtown and the fight over assault weapons could be just what's needed to tip the balance. Ordinary Americans now are involved in a way they weren't before. I don't know yet whether this is going to play out in a very good way. If it, we, We're at what's called a tipping point. The country might go one way or another. I'm afraid if it doesn't go, then all hope is lost. I'm going to sign these orders.
As part of his plan, President Obama signed 23 executive orders, which don't require the support of Congress, to toughen existing gun laws. One of those orders restored funding to the Centers for Disease Control for the study of the public health impact of guns. Research stopped in its tracks by an NRA-backed bill 17 years earlier. Now the new study may well prove what statistics seem to show and what the NRA presumably does not want known, that Americans are less safe, not more, with a firearm in their home. Like most Americans, I believe the Second Amendment guarantees an individual right to bear arms. I respect our strong tradition of gun ownership and the rights of hunters and sportsmen. This will not happen unless the American people demand it. But even with public opinion on his side, a recent poll shows 60% support for an assault weapons ban. The president knows it will take much more to change the gun culture in Congress and the country. For the men and women in big cities and small towns who fall victim to senseless violence each and every day. For all the Americans who are counting on us to keep them safe from harm. Let's do the right thing. Let's do the right thing for them and for this country that we love so much. In the wake of Newtown, it sounded like an idea whose time finally had come. But in this bitterly divided nation, many believe that none of the president's major firearms proposals can get the votes to pass Congress. Begging another question, if what happened in Newtown wasn't bad enough to inspire change, what on earth would be? If nothing changes, I personally do not believe that anything effective will pass. And I go even further than that. I say if that doesn't happen this time around, God help this country because we've lost our last best opportunity to do the right thing. One final sobering note, given the increase in firearms fatalities in the U.S., it is now estimated that by the year 2015, gunshot wounds will pass car crashes as the number one non-medical cause of death for Americans. In 10 U.S. states, it already has.